was mentioned by name the most. Tonight we're going to look at a girl who has no name mentioned in the Bible, but her storyline is very important as well. Uh, and, you know, everything that's in the scripture is there for a reason. This morning we talked a little bit about providence, you know. Yep. Hey, if you're looking through the scripture, everything in there is there for a reason. It's been inspired by God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It behoove us to know about it. Uh, and so I'm excited to deliver this message. I whetted your appetite a little this morning, by, or foreshadowed tonight, by simply saying we're going to talk about a girl. This morning we spoke up Mother's Day with Esther. <clears throat> I hope you enjoy that. And that's a lot for the seasoned ladies uh, and seasoned saints who are women of the church. We really related that to them. But what about any girls who may be listening online? What about any girls who may be in the audience which I don't see. I see, I see a bunch of women. Uh, but uh, hypothetically, what if we have some girls uh, and and or maybe listening on CD at this time or on radio one day, what so have you? Uh, you know, what about them? Oftentimes they're neglecting on Mother's Day, and, and and of course I understand why. You know, they're not mothers, but one day they might, most likely will be, most likely. Uh, and we're going to look at you know a, a different twist on it you know what time you're a maiden in waiting <laughs> if you would uh, there are some things to look at as well when you turn your holy scriptures to second kings take your holy bible the holy word of god turn to the book of second kings second kings now <clears throat> some things about our uh some things to understand about King David. King David, uh, of course, many of you know King David with the book of Psalms. You know King David with the book of 1 and 2 Samuel. But understand, you have the book of Chronicles, 1 and 2 Chronicles. What is his purpose? To chronicle the life of kings. You have the book of Kings. It lists many of the names of the kings. Okay, so you got to understand what each book serves a purpose for as well going on. Uh, we're in the book of 2 Kings. And remember, oftentimes when we think about David, we think about him being the wonderful hymn writer and psalms writer. Um, and I'm going to end the service from the book of Psalms, begin it in 2 Kings. This, I project, will last 10 to 15 minutes. We'll see how long it goes. I'm not in a hurry necessarily, by no means, but it's not much to mention, but man, it's powerful in its significance. Powerful in its ramifications. We would like to say dynamites come in small packages. If you would, you're now in 2 Kings, certainly. Please turn to chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. We're going to talk about this little girl, a sweet, precious Jewish girl. 2 Kings chapter 5. Let's rise to our feet out of respect of God's word being read aloud to the saints. Uh, the word of God says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor. But, what's the tagline? He was a leper. Look at verse 2. And the Syrians had gone out by companies, brought away captive out of the land of Israel, a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. Verse 3. And she said to her mistress, this is Naaman's wife, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Let us pray. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for your precious words here, God. And there's so much we can learn from this sweet little girl. She goes unnamed in the Bible. But God, I think it's there because we can relate it to any sweet little girl. And Lord, there's something we can learn here. So open our eyes and our hearts. It's in Christ's name we pray. No matter who we are. Amen. You may be seated. Let's continue reading. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the girl, the maid, that's of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, which is actually a lot, 
6,000 pieces of gold, that's a lot, and 10 changes of clothes, a raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come to thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, and thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent, he tore his clothes. Man, you can imagine why. And he said, am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends me to recover a man of leprosy? <laughs> Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. He's purposely looking to come and fight and to conquer us because he knows I cannot cure him of leprosy. <laughs> mm. And it was so that when Elisha Hallelujah, the man of God had heard that the king of Israel was distressed, had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore, why, wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Amen. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent out a messenger to him, what you think about this, guys, will befuddle you. I mean, here's a powerful man, and you would think Elisha's going to be standing there at the end of his driveway waiting. No, Elisha's in his house, sends out a messenger to him. <laughs> Elisha sends out a messenger saying, Go and wash in Jordan the river seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Now, you think Naaman's going to accept that? No, the Bible says he's wrong. You think about this. What if Donald Trump, in theory, or not necessarily, what about General a General Schwarzkopf or somebody, you know, General, General Colin Powell comes on Milam Road, right? And he says, I heard you got a man of God there, that preacher at New Hope Baptist Church, and, and let's assume he can heal. And so, and, and I say, go by the Milam Road on Ernest Pond out there and dump yourself, dump yourself a couple of times, and you're going to be healed. And he, it makes him mad because, number one, he's a general. <laughs> okay? You're supposed to go out and meet him. You, number two, he never even saw his face. Who does this guy think he really is, right? And then number three, to, to tell a foreigner to go in my backyard and wash yourself, you know what, what so my, my shower's not good enough? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many problems with a man of pride. Now, I'm not even saying this is the wrong sort of pride, like pride of the sinful pride he has. I understand who Naaman is. Again, I repeat. <coughs> He understood providence. He didn't know who the one true God was, but he knew that God had helped him be a strong warrior. Right. How do you say that, preacher? Look at verse 1. Mm -hmm. It says that uh, by him the Lord had given deliverance to Syria. He knew that. Love he knew that with providence, God had allowed him to be a leader. He knew that by God's help, whomever it is, that's why he won. The odds were stacked against him. Mm -hmm. says he is a man of valor. That means being courageous, full of bravery. He was a man's man of Rambo. Right? I mean, this is, this is the one. But what is his setback? He is a leper. So if you're not in a moment of active war, people kind of distance themselves from this great military leader. Right. He's a leper. Not to mention the physical pains he's going through. Yeah. All right. Now, let's continue. Verse 11. So Naaman was wroth. That means far and away. He's so malice-filled, he's borderline hating. And went away and said, Behold, I thought he was sure to come out to me and stand and call on the name of Yahweh. Notice it's all caps. That's Yahweh, Jehovah. Yeah. His God. Notice it says his God. You may want to underline his God. <laughs> so he's not acknowledging that it's his God. Yeah, he's saying this is that preacher's God. <laughs> and strike his hand all over the place. <laughs> You know, you know, it's funny when people think about a man of God, you know, yeah. they, they have stereotypes in mind, mm -hmm. you know. And so he has here, he, he's going to put his hand on me, you know, he's going to do this <laughs> and recover the leper. Yeah. Been the hands yeah. Are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not just wash in them be clean? So he turned away, turned and went away in a rage. He is angry, man. He's kicking the dirt road, you know? I mean, he's angry. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you, bid thee do some great thing, we know that you have done it. What has thou done it? And of course the answer is yeah, okay? 
If the prophet had gone there and gave him a hard test, he would have proved himself, trying to prove himself worthy because he's a soldier, he's a warrior. You always try to prove yourself worthy. Yeah. That's a man. You know, you try to prove yourself worthy. That's that, that complex going about. Right. But here's something simple. He says, wash yourself. You won't do it. <laughs> How much rather than when he said to thee, wash and you will be, be clean and you're not going to do it. <laughs> so, you can almost sense reluctance. But anyway, he goes down. He dipped himself seven times in Jordan. Bottom line is he did obey. Yeah, Give he credit did. to him. He obeyed. Yeah. You know, he fought tooth and nail. He may even have the wrong pretense in mind. But there's something important about God's word. And I want to drive this point home free <coughs> of charge. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Scripture says obedience is more preferred than sacrifice. That's right. In other words, it's better. Now, you could offer God a million dollars in tithes and offerings. You can offer God houses upon houses. You can offer God to be in fasting 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three weeks. You can offer unto God uh, whatever you want to offer. Your child, you can offer unto God your body, yourself. But he says, that is not preacher. This is not, this is what the word says, right? And if you believe in the inspiration of the word of God, that is the inerrant truth, Okay. He says in his book that he would rather have you obey right. than all the sacrifices you can throw. Amen. This is why Cain went to hell. He didn't obey. Yeah. He offered sacrifice of his hand and work. But anyway, that's a moot point. Point is obedience. Here, he, he fought reluctantly, but he obeyed. Notice what happens. So he obeyed. He goes down and dips himself seven times in Jordan. Notice that in my mind, when I read this, the pretense is he does it reluctantly just because he wanted to see what would happen. Because it doesn't say he obeyed because he wanted to do what was right. He says he obeyed because of the preacher. <laughs> he obeyed because of the saying of the man of God. <laughs> but notice what happens. He says, the Bible says, that then his flesh came again like to the flesh of a little child, little child and was clean. Amen. And notice his response of this miracle. He returned to the man of God. He and all his company would be alive. And came and stood before him. And he says, Behold, now I know there is no L or God. That's a generic name. Capital G, little, little little case O D is L in Hebrew. He says, I know there's no God, no L in all the earth but of Israel, which is Yahweh, Jehovah. He's been converted. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. He's converted now. Okay? He understands. It's like Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a wicked man. Oh, yeah. It's funny. Some people have to have things to occur in their life simply just to humble themselves seemingly so they will turn to God. Nebuchadnezzar was one of them men. David Gabriel, he asked me a question two weeks ago, I think it was. And he said, who would it be if you could be anybody in the past? I said, Jesus. And he said, well, you know what I mean. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I like Thomas Jefferson. I said, I would walk to a philosophized talk to Thomas Jefferson just to pick his brain for a while. And then he, I said, what about you, buddy? He said, Nebuchadnezzar. I said, now, all the people, what's a seven-year-old think of Nebuchadnezzar? I said, why? And he said, because he ate like a cow. I said, that's right. And then I, I said, what else? This boy knows a lot about Nebuchadnezzar. I said, what else? He said, you have big fingernails. I said, that's right. That's right. That's and, right. Um, and, and David Gabriel was just naming all these awesome facts about Nebuchadnezzar and making me proud. <laughs> and he, and, but David Gabriel understood something. But he, well, he didn't say the word, but he was telling me about conversion. How Nebuchadnezzar got converted at the very end of his life. He had to go through awful times. But God humbled an emperor <laughs> mm -hmm. and converted him. And um, Nebuchadnezzar, I firmly think, is a brother we will see in heaven. And uh, a lot of people will consider Nebuchadnezzar the Hitler of old. But the difference being, seemingly, is he got converted. That's right. And uh, that tells you something about God's grace. That's open for all of man. It 
doesn't matter what sin in theory you commit. Okay? The only sin you can't commit is the sin of not becoming born again. Mm -hmm. It is a sin not to become born again. That's the unpardonable sin. It's blaspheming the Holy Ghost. That's straight from the scriptures. You cannot blaspheme the Holy Ghost. That's the unpardonable sin. And what's that mean, preacher? It means the way power of God moves. Blaspheming the Holy Ghost. The Father does what with salvation. It's very clear in the book of Romans and Galatians we're going to study. The Father sends forth the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit moves you to receive Christ. To blaspheme the Holy Ghost is put that bulwark, that wall, a barrier there to where you won't receive Christ. Amen. That's an unpardonable sin. So when God's moving your heart to be saved and you deny that, you have sinned against God. Amen. And so that's the only sin, you know, <clears throat> now, that was a moot point. I don't even know where I was getting with that. But anyway, that's good stuff. So let's 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 re relook. We're just going to freeze there. He got converted. That's good enough for me right now. I wanted to brought now all that's actually going to be longer than what I'm about to tell you, I think. Let me say this: life can take you on unexpected turns. Sister Screaming. When you was a little girl, chances are you never heard of Clinton, South Carolina. Um, probably, I mean, from Charleston, but I don't think I heard of it, no. So, some of you may have, Brother Ron, you may have never heard of Clinton, South Carolina until you reached a certain age, and so forth. Life can take an unexpected turn, unexpected twists. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Painful turns. Sister Spring used to tell me about that very day when Brother Spring tripped over and how things seemingly have uh, went into motion. Life can take you on unexpected pains as well. One little girl in Israel found herself in an unexpected twist. Mm -hmm. In 2 Kings chapter 5, the whole chapter opens up, and contextually speaking, it's from her viewpoint. Did you catch that? It's from her viewpoint. Everything you've read is from her viewpoint that was set off in motion. That's very significant to the reader that you should slow down when you're reading it and realize this is from the girl's viewpoint. Who now more about who is this girl? She was a slave. There's no easy way or cookie cutting around this. She's a slave. She's a war prize. The Bible makes that very clear in verses 1 and 2. Very clear. She became a slave, a property of Naaman's family. She's under the property of Naaman's family. Hey, and, and yet that story unfolds is contrary to what you may think. Right? It's contrary, what we just read is contrary to what we would expect. Okay, if I was a boy, David Gabriel's age, and opposing enemies come to my town, ransack us, take over, and enslave me, I think I'll have a lot of self-pity. Seemingly a lot of anger. But instead of self-pity, we find this girl pitying her master. Did you guess that? Instead of self-pity, she pitied her master. <clears throat> if I was captured and enslaved, I would wish evil upon him. I sure would. I would wish evil upon him. Instead of wishing evil upon those who captured her, she hoped for his well-being. Get that? Come on, heart of a Christian. This girl is more Christian than you and I. <clears throat> she, she didn't wish evil upon him. She, she wanted hope uh, that they would have well-being. Right. I would be crushed by my circumstances. Woe is me if I was going to be growing up as a slave like that. <coughs> but she rose above them. She rose above her circumstances. It reminds me of Matthew chapter 5. Amen. Brother Springman likes Matthew. Mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 5 verse 44. Jesus says, I say to you, love your enemies. Yep. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. 
pray for them that, that despitefully use you mm -hmm. and persecute you. It reminds me of Jeremiah 15, verse 15. It says, O Lord, thou knowest, remember me, visit me, and revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering, and know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. Who is Naaman? Naaman's this little girl's master. He's a successful military general, commander in the Syrian army. He's a powerful military leader that came in, took this little Jewish girl as a slave into slavery. And what was his intent with the little girl? Perhaps raise her up. Most likely it was to raise her up and sell her into slavery as a woman to make more money, kind of like cows, cattle would do. <clears throat> Going from a calf to a bull, right? But uh, perhaps raise her up just to be a simple house servant her whole life. Perhaps raise her up and make her a beautiful young bride. Polygamy is common. Make her, you know, you train her up as a girl, set the rules of the household, and you marry her as a young bride. Perhaps raise her up as a prostitute. You know, perhaps raise her up as a simple servant. I simply don't know, and neither do you. That's right. <laughs> we can only we can only speculate, but what the Bible does tell us is that he was a leper. Mm -hmm. And in Israel, a person with leprosy was shunned. And this little girl had the right people. Her parents undoubtedly taught her some good things because she understood, once again, her roots. Remember from this morning, she understood her heritage. She understood that when there's leprosy involved, only God can solve this. That's right. Sufferers of leprosy were forced to announce in Israel that they're unclean in front of everybody and had to constantly hold their hand in front of their mouth, say, unclean. If a person walked near them, they say, I'm unclean. Not to spread any germs. All right? She undoubtedly saw some of that, perhaps, well, perhaps saw some of that too. And all this was a painful reminder of what her master is going through. Now, this little Jewish girl remembers her heritage. She remembers her customs. She remembers her laws. And most importantly, faith. In simple faith, and listen, this is beautiful. In simple faith, a little, little girl suggested for her mistress, that would be Naaman's wife, that Naaman ought to see the prophet of God in Samaria, whom she talking about, Elisha. This is when Elisha is the prophet of Israel. This little girl understood spiritual leadership as well. Here she was very certain, very sure that Elisha would be able to bring about healing of awful disease of leprosy. And by the way, there had to be some form, some note of conviction behind her words. It wasn't just a recommendation. It seems like she shook him. Some conviction in her suggestion because Naaman took that girl seriously. Mm -hmm. You know what? Eventually, he was healed by God. So as, as I get ready to close, I want you to listen carefully. I think the whole point of this lesson in the scripture, <laughs> number one, I got just a couple of points. Number one, it doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your gender, it doesn't matter your economic status, doesn't matter your race, whatever. God can use you. Amen. Amen. That's the first thing that leaps out to me on why God preserved this in the scripture. When I'm examining it, saying, how is this applicable to me today? I see that jump through the pages, yelling at me. God can use anybody. That's right. He That's uses right. this little, little Jewish girl. She's most likely between seven and nine years old. God can use you. Number two, Here's my second point. Sometimes all we can do is point a person to God. That's yep. right. And if you're taking notes, put that down, but put dot, dot, dot. But that might be the best thing possible. That's right. Sometimes all you might be able to do is simply point a person to God. But you know what? Sometimes that's the best thing you can do. <clears throat> That's the best thing you can simply do at that moment. 
If the Lord is speaking wisdom into you to instruct others in that moment, do it. The faith of one little girl, the faith of one little child set into motion a chain of events in which God was glorified. And I'm sure King Jesus sitting there in his rightful throne in glory was just a smiling when Naaman was converted. Yeah. And there's a crown, a soul winner's crown for that little girl. Yep. Who helped convert a soldier of a king, general of a king. We should be alert of our opportunities today. God can accomplish miracles that's right. with a small action. Yeah, that's true. You could justify it, and that little girl could have said, I can't heal leprosy, and never thought twice about it. It said, whoa, sorry, my master, I feel bad for you. But again, what does she do? She goes out there and brings forth good recommendations. God can accomplish miracles through a small action. Young or old, God is willing to use you for whom you are. So in closing, will you allow God to use you? Psalm 119. Look at this last verse. Psalm 119. As I've said, something about King David. King David is all through the Samuels, 1st and 2nd Samuel. He's all through in and out, splash through Chronicles and Kings, 1st and 2nd Kings. Of course, he's the primary writer in the book of Psalms. And it's believed that David had this same little girl in his mind when he wrote Psalm 119, verse 46. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. Amen. Think about that. You can say, I'm not worthy to stand before a king or I'll get scared on what I need to say. Just calm yourself down and realize the kingdom of heaven is a childlike faith. And that little girl can stand before a king. In this case, her master, who was the soldier of the king. You can stand before kings too. That's right. You can stand before great leaders and give them a conviction on the right things they need to do. The right things they need to say and put forth to actions. That can have huge ramifications for the future. I know it was a relatively brief message, but I hope it was impactful. I tell you this, it really, really made my spirit smile, so to speak, as I was studying this out. And I know I didn't give you something with great stunning revelation with PowerPoints and writing stuff. I only gave you two points, I think it was, but the, the greater idea is that God can use you Right. He used this little, little girl who was in captivity. And then got, he received glorification because she was willing to do what was right and obey. So uh, Lord bless you. May that have encouraged you. If you're a little lady, if you're a little girl in waiting, um, if you're a little child, now you have the ability to stand before kings too. You have teachers, you have principals, you have uh, grandparents, you have parents, you have cousins, and they don't know Jesus. And if the Lord tells you to go ahead and talk about himself, go ahead. You're not going to harm a soul. And who knows, if you tell your testimony before a king, that is to say a leader, it can set forth actions that lead to miracles in people's Amen. lives. Amen. You never know who might be listening. And in the kingdom of God, you don't know who could be most impactful. Yeah. That little girl was most impactful. These, these young boys, our church have a few young boys. They may be seven or eight years old, but they could be far more impactful than me. If the Lord's will. They could be far more impactful than you. They could be, uh, and vice versa. You know, someone like Granny can be more impactful than me and someone uh, more impactful than little children. God can use all people of all ages, of all gender, of all creeds, of all races, etc. So allow the Lord to use you. Lord bless you. Lord keep you.
Speak, your test, speak his testimony before kings. The Bible says you will not be ashamed. That's right. You will not be ashamed. Uh, because guess what? Punishment comes and persecution comes. You say, I, I did what was right. That's right. Amen. Let's close. Father, thank you so much for all you've done for us. And thank you for uh, recording now with this little Jewish girl. She goes unnamed, but wow, she was powerful to boast your name to boast what, what people needed to do to get right. And because of her, Naaman done the right thing in the end and got saved. And that's, that's just an amazing thought that someone as little and young as seven years old may help in salvation. Uh, truly, age is no matter in your kingdom. Truly, sex is no matter in your kingdom. Gender so truly, Lord, race is no matter in your kingdom. Of course, all that matters is those who trust the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ and the bloodshed, whom we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins. Blessed be your name, King Jesus. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.